Hello, welcome to the tutorial Introduction to Digital Control for Power Electronics. This tutorial is, is part of the program of the 2021 IEEE Green Technologies Conference. My name is Tiago Davi Curbuzarello and I'm going to present the second part of this tutorial. My part is divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to present an overview and the general theory behind digital control. And in the second part, I'm going to show you some real manners to employ digital controllers and we go through an example of tuning a digital control in a power electronic application. Before we get started, I'd like to say a disclaimer. All the content of my part is my opinion only. Along the presentation, I'm going to name some books, some authors, some publishing and some manufacturers. I do not talk on behalf of them. With that said, I hope you enjoy this tutorial and I hope you learn new concepts of digital control for power electronics. Introduction to Digital Control for Power Electronics, Part 2. Introduction. If we start talking about digital control for power electronics, we will realize very fast that this is a very broad field. There are hundreds of topologies, different kinds of filters, different types of inputs like DC or AC sources, a lot of kind of applications and so on. And for this tutorial, we need to limit our discussions, but I'll try to give you my best in order to, to uh, present a great overview of digital control for power electronics. And let's start with this overview. Even though the topic of this tutorial is very broad, we can essentially summarize any power electronics applications as follows. For any kind of power electronics applications, we will find power devices like transistors and diodes, we will find passive elements like doctor, capacitors and resistors, usually in our in usually to make a filter. And we have also different types of sources like AC sources or DC source. We have loads in our power electronics applications like a machine or even a resistor or even a nonlinear load. We also have sensors, current sensors and voltage sensors. And for most important is the digital control unit, which is the focus of our tutorial. The combination of these elements makes you have a boost converter or a grid connector inverter or an electric drive for a machine and so on. So the manner how these components are connected is what define your power electronics applications. And our focus is here on a digital control unit. You have been noticed in this short introduction that the digital control unit is the location of our digital controller. The control unit receives information from the system through the sensors. It runs the algorithm of the digital controller and perhaps other functions, and it sends to the system a common signal, like a PWM. Nevertheless, the connections of sensors to the central unit is not direct. We need to employ a conditional circuit to adjust the signal that is going to the central unit. The conditional circuit is discussed in the following. Conditional circuit. I'm here with some blocks presented previously, but now just some of them. The power devices, the sensors, and the digital control unit. Again, these blocks may represent any kind of power electronics application. Our discussion now is on the conditional circuit. The main reason that we need to have a conditional circuit is because we are measuring variables along the, our power electronic application and these variables may have any nature. It may be DC or AC. It may vary from any value. So our digital control in unit must receive the value vary from 0 to 5 volts or 0 to 3 volts. It depends on the digital control unit we are using. But this is the main purpose of our conditional circuit. We need to suit our variables that we are measuring into the range of the input part of our analog to digital converter of our digital control unit. The direction of the information in this case goes from the sensors, the signal passes through the conditional circuit and later goes to the input part of the digital control unit. The representation is repeated here. And I'm here with a box, I will list here some features that the conditional circuit may have or must have. Suppose that we are measuring a current in our application and this current may vary from minus 100 
to one to 100 amps the first thing that we need to do is the amplitude adjustment and this can be achieved by the sensor and by the circuit the sensor itself already reduces the amplitude of our measured value to a, a lower value for instance from minus 5 to 5 volts and usually the sensors convert like this um, uh, current into a voltage signal this is quite normal but we need also to include a gain, an amplitude adjustment here in the circuit because sometimes you need to make a thinner adjustment it depend, depending on the sensor you are using you may have some tolerance or error so your our conditional circuit must have something to adjust the amplitude the th second thing that we need to have in our conditional circuit is offset adjustment because after you reduce this value here in, in the range of the control unit we need to apply an offset because the input of the digital control unit receives only positive values and we are measuring here on alternating current which has negative value in order to the digital control unit to understand that this is a negative value we need to include here an offset and the offset is nothing more than making the zero to a positive value you adjust this offset so the control unit knows now that any value below such an offset is considered negative so your control strategy can run properly the third thing that we need to consider is protection because suppose that you are measuring such a current and suddenly there is a abrupt change in the current with a high level a high value as this conditional circuit is just reducing the amplitude and making the offset this would appear right here and may danger your input of your digital control unit in order to avoid that we need to include protections which will saturate this signal limit and then your digital input is protected another thing that we need to consider in our conditional circuit is buffer depending on the sensor you are using and depending on the input of the digital control unit you need to handle the levels of the voltage and the current in a, in a proper manner and then we use a buffer it's just to apply again in our signal that we are handle another thing that we can employ in our conditional circuit is signalization we can turn on off and off some LEDs for instance in order to signalize that there is a over voltage or something else for someone to be aware that there is a condition that must be deserves some attention signalization is something common in our conditional circuit and one of the most important information and when you design this conditional circuit it is that your circuit cannot present phase or amplitude error you are measuring here an alternating current and this is translated into a smaller signal with offset but the phase delay cannot exist this zero must be the same zero and the amplitude also cannot present error you are reduced intentionally amplitude this is quite common but regarding errors this cannot be present and all of these stuffs can be done in our conditional circuit by analog electronics like operation amplifiers trim pots resistors capacitors and so on with commonly used analog electronics components we can uh, design and employ a conditional circuit now that we have a good conditional circuit let's look at the digital controllers returning here with our conventional blocks and also with our conditional circuit the control unit is now represented with this simplified block diagram after measuring some variables along our power electronic application the conditional circuit sends the signals to the adc input of our digital control unit and this is the most simplified diagram for a digital controller the variable that we are measuring is compared with a reference and the error passes through the digital controller which in turn will act in the PWM modulator or any other modulator and this signals and this signal goes to the power devices to turn on and off transistors and so on again this is the most simplified uh, 
digital control that we may have in a parallel electronics application. Talking about digital controller, we are going to realize that there are a lot of digital controllers. We can start out of our discussion dividing the digital controllers into two groups, the linear controllers and the nonlinear controllers. What should I use? Of course, it depends on the application, but most of power electronics application is nonlinear. However, these applications can be linearized in a specific point and we can use linear controllers. If you look at the most common linear controllers in power electronics, they are the proportional integrator controller, the PI, we have the PID controller, which is our proportional integral derivative controller, the proportional resonant controller, known as PR. We have also lead, lag, and lead and lag controller. Of course, all of these controllers have constant coefficient, constant parameters, and these controllers may be employed in natural, stationary, or rotating reference frames. This is the most common controllers found in power electronics applications. Of course, when you can linearize the model and when these linear controllers show satisfactory behavior under your design specification. This figure shows a system just for illustrations where linear controllers can be employed. The system has an input DC source, a voltage source converter, an output filter and the grid. Some variables are measured and sent to the compensator block. And this strategy is running at the key reference frame, but the point here is that this system can be employed with linear controllers like the PI, PR. It depends on what kind of response you want and what kind of response you allow, you allow for this system to present. Regarding nonlinear controllers, we may find the sliding mode controller, the fuzzy logic controller, artificial neural network controller, the model predictive controller. This is a really attractive controller for nonlinear power electronic applications. The adaptive controllers, which is basically some linear controllers but with adaptive coefficients. So I have our algorithm to update the values of the parameters of our linear controller. As a result, this of course is a nonlinear controller. This figure shows an example of a model predictive controller. Notice that there are a lot of functions here that is completely nonlinear in nature, like the extrapolation, the minimization of a cost function, the predictive model, and so on. This is an example of a model predictive controller from this book, and by the way, I think this is the best book about model predictive control for power electronics application. Summarizing, the choice between a linear or nonlinear controller is based on several aspects like is the system variable along the time? How much uh, complexity we are willing to deal with in our system? Do we need to know the model and the parameters beforehand? in our digital controller design. Are there constraints that should be applied in order to have a good behavior of our controller? What is the modulation we are using? And what dynamic response we want in our system? These, of course, are some questions that we need to answer in order to make a good decision if we can go to a, through a linear or a nonlinear controller. How to design a digital controller for power electronic applications? There is a lot of manners to design digital controller. Of course, it depends on the controller that we are using. But for linear, the most common methodologies to design controller are Ziegler Nichols methodology, the frequency response, root locus technique, the K factor and also try and error. Even though this is sometimes not acceptable for the majority of researchers, but there it is a technique that we usually we employ in designing, for instance, a PI controller. You have two parameters. You can uh, make some guess if the values are high, low and, low, and, low and high, and really fast we can reach a good values of the PI controller by trying it. Of course, this is really personal. There are people that 
like that. There are people that do not accept such a methodology, but we need to list here as a methodology to design linear controllers. For nonlinear controller, it also depends on the controller that we are employing, but we have specific methodologies like the training the controller, there is the technique of minimum, squared error, and so on. Again, we need to look what controller we are using and looking for some specific methodologies to design such a controller. The methodologies presented in the preview slide, especially for linear controller, usually result in analog controller. And we are looking for digital controller. And this figure shows how we can get digital controllers. This figure shows that we need to start with the system modeling in S domain. Then we can choose between two paths. One that is to apply the Z transform, then we will get the system that we have just modeled in the Z domain, or we can go through design the controller based on conventional methods in still in S domain, which are the methodologies presented previously. But if you if you get the model and then we suddenly discretize into the Z domain, we can design the digital controller, which is a transfer function in the Z domain. By pole placement math, we can design a digital controller by state feedback. We can also apply the bilinear transform, getting the system modeling in the fictitious W domain. Then we design a controller based on the conventional methods, resulting here in a controller, a transfer function in this W domain. Then we apply the inverse bilinear transformation resulting in our digital controller. And this last path is one of the most used that we design the controller by conventional maths, like those shown in the previous slide, like frequency response, root locus, k factor. We will result in a controller still in S domain. Then we just apply a discretization in this transfer function resulting in our digital controller. What path should we use? Of course, again, it depends on the controller, it depends on the application, but a good candidate is this path here. We can design a digital controller by starting design an uh, analog controller and then discretize such a controller resulting in this digital controller. This may be the first option. If you see that this is satisfactory, the behavior is as expected, then you have designed the controller properly. Otherwise, we need to make more specific uh, design methodology like, first of all, apply the Z transformation, get the model in the Z domain, you have a red environmental, a digital environmental, and then you can design your controller properly. But look, let's look a little bit on the some techniques for discretization because sooner or later we need to discretize something in our system and this is a really in interesting topic to discuss in digital control of power electronics. Discretization. This figure shows some discretization methods. There are three major types of discretization. The approximate methods, the quasi-exact methods, and also the exact methods. By beginning here at the right of this figure, we have the approximate maths, which are the numerical differentiation and the numerical integration. These three I think is the most used linearization uh, discretization technique for linear controllers. We can apply the bilinear transformation, we can apply the back Euler, backward Euler approximation, and we can apply the forward Euler approximation. But other methods like the quasi exact, we have matrix factorization, trunked Taylor series, and looking at the exact math, we have the invariant math, the impulse pole zero matching, step for a zero order holder, and the ramp. So again, the question is what should, uh, what discretization should I use in such a specific controller? It depends on the controller, but for linear controllers, I can say that we can use this. For model predictive controller, which is this figure come from, we can use this one that is, that are dashed in the borders. After knowing this theoretical background of digital controllers, and let's suppose that we designed a voltage controller. We choose the kind of the controller, we followed a methodology to get the parameters of the controller, and we employed it 
into our power electronic application. However, a question may arise. How can we be sure if this controller is properly designed? Watch next. Let's suppose that we designed a digital controller. And a common question is how to know if the controller is properly designed. This question is valid for any kind of controller, any kind of variable that you are controlling. Maybe a voltage, current, speed, it doesn't matter. The question is, how can I know if this controller is properly designed? A good approach is to check the reference signal and the controlled variable. We need to alter the reference signal from our digital signal processor or digital signal controller because usually the reference is within our digital control unit and then we need in somehow to alter this signal in order to check in the oscilloscope for instance. It is good to check steady state condition, initialization, reference step, under disturbance, load step and so on. Then we can realize if our controller is properly designed. And also we can check if the response under a uh, step change, for instance, is in accordance to, to what we designed. We can also check the error signal in our control strategy. Let's look at some examples. This figure here shows a voltage that we are controlling in a power electronics application. In blue we have the reference signal and in orange we have the controlled variable which is the output voltage. We can see here the initialization process. During the initialization we see here such a behavior. If this is acceptable or not you may tell, you are the designer for that. But we can clearly see here that in the state state condition our controlled voltage is following its reference with negligible state state error. This is another example of a different controller and we can check this that this controller is not so properly designed because there is a short error in amplitude and then we can conclude if our controller is actually properly designed. A third example of initialization process with another controller we can see that in state state the control voltage is following the reference, but during transient interval we see here some oscillation. Again, if this is acceptable or not, if this is within the limit that you are expecting or not, it is up to you to answer. But this is a good approach to properly verify if our controller is correctly designed. Initialization process, stat state. We can also here see some step in the reference, so the reference was in such a value and suddenly the reference is, for instance, doubled. We can see how the system behaves, how the controller behaves. And then we can see here that the controller keeps following the reference after the step, but with such oscillatory behavior during the transient interval. This is for another controller, the same step, we can clearly see how it behaves. And these are some features that we need to check if to verify if our controller is properly designed. Another thing that we may try to visualize is the operation of the controller under disturbances. We see that the reference is being followed and the voltage here now that we are controlling is not very good as pre showed previously because now the inverter is connected to a nonlinear load and also there is a disturbance in at the DC link and we can check we can check if this disturbance appears at the output voltage. You can clearly see here that the disturbance is correctly being rejected but the voltage suffers a little bit to maintain a sinusoidal waveform because of the nonlinear load. At least you can conclude that the disturbance is not going to the output voltage. It means that our controller is properly designed. If you say that this is acceptable or not, again, it's up to you, you are the designer, you need to know if this is quite acceptable. Here is another situation, but now I'm controlling the inverter in current. Another step that I made here is that uh, change in the direction of the power flow. We have here a current out of phase related to the voltage, and suddenly you have the current in phase. The blue is the reference and now the purple is the output current. We see here the behavior and see how can 
this reference can change. Oh, uh, correction here. The purple is the reference and the blue is the output current. And this is a scenario where we are changing the reference. We can see how it behaves. And this also verifying the controller under the injection of harmonics, for instance. The reference in purple is with harmonics and we can clearly see that the output current is still following the reference. It means that we can conclude that this current controller is well designed. In this way, we can verify if our controller is properly designed. You can also plot the error, but the error has some limitations because you see here some amplitude and we cannot conclude very much if this such amplitude is acceptable or not. For me, the best way to verify if the controller is properly designed is plotting the reference signal, the controller variable, and check if it is following the reference under a variety of scenarios like initialization, steady state condition, disturbances, load step, reference step, and so on. These results I showed you belong to my research that I was doing in my lab in the last years.